Our last interview of the day is Malcolm Kotler, who is a, a local bookseller. And Malcolm, can you just tell us a little about your background, family, schools, where you grew up, what your parents did, siblings, etc.? Right. Uh, I want to begin with my father because he was a major influence on me in two ways concerning books. Uh, he was a university professor, and from the time I started college, university professor was the only profession I consider for myself. So after graduating from college, I went directly to grad school to get that degree you have to have if you want to be a university um, professor. And um, this was the time of the Vietnam War. I had a low draft lottery number. Right. And I knew I was going to be affected by the draft. And sure enough, after two years of grad school, I had to take a leave of absence to perform two years of alternative service as a conscientious objector. But when that was over with, I went back to grad school, finished the degree, and got a job on the faculty at the University of Minnesota, where I taught for 10 years, 1975 to 1985. Uh, my field was the history of science, and I taught both evolutionary biology and biology. So because my father was a university professor, I became a university professor, although our fields were totally different. Now, the second thing that was important is he was a serious book collector ah. who, as a customer, was known to a number of members of ABAA. And from a pretty early age, I was aware of his book collecting because he kept the collection at home, not in his university office. And I even remember that he let me take one of his 16th century English translations to English class in ninth grade for show and tell. Oh, wow. But thinking about it, I do not remember actually ever going with him to a bookstore. Mm. But his book collecting did rub off on me, although it took time. I was, unlike some of our members of ABA, a not precocious. Um, I was not a book collector, much less a bookseller when I was in high school. I did not buy books. In college, I was buying books more than my friends, but the book buying I was doing did not deserve to be called book collecting. I mean, <laughs> book buying, even if you buy a lot of books, is not collecting. But in grad school, it did start to change, so that by the time I became that university professor at the University of Minnesota, I, I think that my book collecting did deserve to be called, my book buying did deserve to be called book collecting. So again, because my father was a book collector, I became a book collector, although our interests were totally How old were you at this time? Um, I became that university professor at age 28. Um, but, you know, I'm not sitting here talking to you today because I'm a university professor as a book collector. I'm here as a bookseller. What was, your, what was the year that, uh, that you left being a university professor and began to think in terms of, of books as well, something else? But you see, it happened while I was a university oh, while you professor. Were there. Okay. Yeah, because that's the next chapter of the story. Because when I got to Minnesota in 1975, I met two people who were responsible for my becoming a bookseller. The first was Rob Wozniak, who was a few years older than me and was another member of the faculty at the university. His field was child development. He had a personal book collection in psychology that was a lot better than my collection <laughs> in biology. But here's the important thing. He was also a bookseller. Ah. He was a member of a cooperative bookstore near the university campus called the Dinky Town Antiquarian Bookstore. Sure. And uh, I remember going to that bookstore for the first time within a day or two of my arriving in Minnesota. And it was through the bookstore, not the university, that I met Rob. But that wasn't the model for book selling that he provided me. I've never had and never wanted to have an open shop. He was also a specialist bookseller doing business under the name of the epistemologist, issuing catalogs in his academic and collecting field of psychology. And that was the model he provided me. It was Rob who showed me that how by being a bookseller, I would enhance my book collecting. Oh, yeah. And so in my early days of book selling, that's why I did it. Yeah. I wanted to improve my book collection. And within a couple of years, I was ready to issue my first catalog. And I used Rob's IBM Selectric typewriter <laughs> to prepare the camera-ready copy. And I was thinking about this. If memory serves me, all the catalogs I prepared while I was still at the university, yeah. I used Rob's um, uh, typewriter. Now, the other person 
in Minnesota who was responsible for my becoming a bookseller, someone you will know, was Jim Cummings. Not to be confused with our ABA colleague right. Jim Cummins, as he sometimes is, but Jim and his then wife Kristen had a bookstore in the same dinky town area near the university called the Book House. In fact, Rob Wozniak left the dinky town antiquarian bookstore to be their partner oh. in the Book House. Now, almost everyone who has an open shop, they get their books locally. But that wasn't the way it worked with Jim and Kristen. They traveled extensively all over the country buying books. Now, it's true they were doing this in part because they had great personal collections. But most of the books they bought, they brought back to put in the book house. So it was very exciting for all of us when they got back from these sure. trips to see what they bought. Now, why do I mention this? Because within two years, I was making these trips with them. I remember the first time I made a trip, it was from... Minnesota back to Boston. Wow. Jim wanted to go to Good Speeds and other stores. I said, can I go with you? <laughs> Fine. That was in the summer of 77. Wow. And boy, were those trips fun because Jim is just this fabulous raconteur. He's kept this personal diary every day of his life for over 60 years. And when you wow. do that, your experiences are cemented in your memory. Oh, yeah. So thanks to Rob and Jim, I started as a part-time bookseller while I was still at the university, and it grew and grew and grew to the point where I said to myself, I have to make a choice. Is it going to be university professor or is it going to be bookseller? Because there just weren't enough hours in the day to yeah. do both the way I wanted to do them. Uh, well, you know the choice I made. I wouldn't be here if I'd you chosen made the, professor. You, you made the right one. But the reason, I want to I emphasize that word choice because after I joined ABAA, I discovered that there were actually a fair number of others who, like me, had gone to grad school with the hope of becoming an academic. Uh, some never finished, but others did. They got their degree, but either they couldn't get a job or they got a job and didn't get tenure, then they turned the book selling. I had my tenure. I was set for life in academia mm. if I wanted it. But I made the choice to give up voluntarily the academic life for a career change to bookseller. Uh, now, you're not going to be the least bit surprised that my academic college, which is totally stupefied by my of course. decision, you What's know, it's hard you? to get a job. I had a good one, and here I was giving it up voluntarily. And to do what? Be a bookseller? I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, but it is the decision I made. So that was when, in 1985, I moved from Minnesota to Massachusetts, where I've been ever since, and been a bookseller ever since, for 26 years, a lot longer than the 10 years I was an academic. Yeah. Now, if there's time, I'd like to give credit to a few other people, sure. because though... Rob and Jim were my first mentors, and I know you like to ask people who yeah, were their absolutely. mentors. Neither of them was a specialist in science and medicine, which was my chosen field in book selling. But I did meet early on three other people who were specialists in science and medicine, and they were the really important mentors once I yeah, got into yeah. this you know, in a bigger way. Now, the first... Uh, you know all three of these people. The first um, is Ray Giordano, who does business under the name of the Antiquarian Scientist. He's never wanted to join ABAA, but he'd be a great member if, he, terrific if, so. if he did. I can't remember how Ray found me or vice versa, but he was one of my earliest customers. And from talking to him on the phone and from then to the, today, Ray is a telephone guy. That's the way he wants to communicate. Uh, forget about email. I mean, you'll yeah. do it, but talking on the phone is what he wants to do. From talking to him and looking at his catalogs, I mean, I could see he was way ahead of me. Uh, he did a lot of things right in his early days of book selling. I, I didn't. But after about 30 years, I think I finally closed the gap and caught so. up to him. Um, now, the second person uh, is Jeremy Norman, who was one of my sponsors when I applied right. to ABAA. Uh, I remember meeting Jeremy. It was in 1979. I went to San Francisco, uh, not for books, really, but for my sister's wedding. I already knew about him, though, so I wanted to go to his bookstore. I did. That's when I met him. Uh, he's only two years older than me, but he'd been selling books for a long time already. In fact, this is sort of mind-boggling to me. In 1971, when he's in his mid-20s, he issued his first catalog yeah. after over 30 years. I have not been able to produce a catalog. You still have 
So I still haven't caught up to where he was 40 years ago, you know, in his 20s. But those catalogs of his were just invaluable yeah, to me to learn what books a specialist in science and medicine wanted to have in their stock. Now, the third person, and I'm not going to do a Rick Perry on you where I can't think of that third oh, thing good. for 54 <laughs> seconds. The third person was John Gatch. Now, John was only one year older than me, than me but as you know, you know, he died a, a very sad and, and early death a couple yeah. of years ago. Um, it would have been impossible for me or anyone else to model themselves on John, on a mistake to even try. Yeah. Uh, he was so different from everyone else I've ever known in the book world, but he loved to talk and I loved to listen to yeah. him talk because he said so many unusual, different things. So when you take Rob and Jim who started me and then Ray, Jeremy, and John who early on were my mentors within my field, but there you've sort of got my story yeah. of how I got into books from academia and um, brings you up to about the time I joined ABAA, which I think was 1989. So uh, I don't remember per se. That, I, but I think, I think that's a, when it was. Sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. So um, 22 so, years has gone by um, quickly. Yeah. 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 I. I uh, um, you know. Well, there, there you go with the background. A okay, long, we'll long background. No, that's there, okay. You know? You've covered yeah. covered some good yeah. some good things. Um, what is your uh, internet? Presence? Uh, are you are you uh, listed? Do you have all your stuff on? Or, or yeah. what, what does the internet do for you as yeah. a bookstore? Well, let me preface that by saying, whenever you talk about new technology, I mean you can talk about the early adopters and the late adopters, and then me, the very late the adopter. Very late. Uh, I'll give you a few examples that'll tell you all you need to know. I mean, I was the next last person to get a cell phone. I do not yet. <laughs> I do not yet have a smartphone. Oh. Um, I was the next last person to get a digital camera. I use it, but I still haven't learned how to customize any settings. You know, if I can't take a picture on the automatic settings, forget it. Uh, I do have a computer. I do use it, but uh, I don't yet have a laptop, and I've never, I haven't yet bought a tablet of any kind. Um, I have books for sale on the internet, but only on one collective site. I do not have my own website. So from all that and other things I could tell you that you don't really need to know at this point, you can see uh, I've been slow to adapt to the Internet. However, there is one use of the Internet um, that's been very valuable to me, and that's to do research on the yeah. books I want to buy and sell. Because I was used to doing research just from my academic days, and the Internet has just made it so much easier with so many... Benefits. I mean, I don't have to enumerate them, but I think that um, I deserve at least a grade of a B plus, if not an A, for taking advantage of advantage of the opportunities that the internet provides. But my biggest deficiency is clearly taking advantage of the opportunities to sell. Well, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, so. I'm, I, I, I realize it. Will I ever get around yeah. to my own website, etc.? Well, every year I keep saying I will, and every year my son says, "Yeah, sure." You know. yeah. But, yeah. but uh, I'd like to make though a general comment about the internet as um, uh, a foe, if you want to put it, of me that has nothing to do with my own personal skills or deficiencies. Mm. It really has killed one major aspect of my business because you can divide my books into a couple of basic categories, the so-called primary sources, the actual scientific and medical books. And then the secondary sources, which are the histories, biographies, bibliographies, written about the history of science, history of medicine. Now, academics write those books and they buy them. So first as an academic selling books on the side and then as an ex ex-academic selling books full-time, I naturally gravitated to those secondary sources for my inventory. They were easiest to find. They have a lower price structure, mm -hmm. so they're easier to buy. And so I built up this huge inventory of secondary sources. Mm -hmm. uh, in my not-so-humble opinion, I think I had the best such inventory of both history of science and history of medicine in the country. Multiple copies of books, because I issued regular catalogs, I'd get multiple orders, I'd have the books all ready to go. It worked great for a number of years. I mean, I knew absolutely 
that a certain specific amount of money at a minimum would come in every time I issued a catalog. Of course, often I did better than that. Then came the internet. Mm -hmm. And what did it show? Of course, these books had been there all along. They'd just been hard to find. And I was one of few people who had a lot of them in one place, so it worked. But it no longer mattered that I had a lot of them in one place. Somebody who could use the internet could find them anywhere. That's they didn't right. need me anymore. That's so right. my secondary source tier of books has basically become irrelevant. I don't buy them anymore. Now, I haven't taken the time to do what Bob Fleck did with this massive repricing of inventory to liquidate them, but it's over with for me, yeah. for the secondary sources. And that was my bread and butter for so many years. And Same it's gone. everybody. Well, Gordon Hollis, our colleague, wrote yeah. an article that was in our newsletter yeah. some years ago about his own business, where his field was totally different, but the same division existed for him. He dumped all those books on the history of dance. They were, as he said, he no longer even looked to see what their prices were when he saw them at book fairs. It didn't matter. He didn't want them anymore. And the exact same thing has happened to me. Uh, so what, what was the number, how many items did you have pre-internet? Well, first of all, of course, I still have most of them, thousands of volumes. Wow. Well over half of my inventory was this history, biography, bibliography stock. I still have most of them. Now, by the way, you know, there's still some demand for these books. Yeah. You just can't ask any money for them because no. 80 to 90 percent of them, if you look them up on the Internet, they're there. It's and a, they're usually pretty cheap. It's a race to the bottom. Um, so I still have the books because I haven't done what needs to be done to sell them. You haven't bitten the bullet but yet. But I'm not going to buy any more of them. And without mentioning names, I know of only one colleague in my area of book selling who's still actively buying those books. We've all seen the light, and uh, it's just uh, over with. It was great while it lasted, and I, of course, thought it was going to last forever. Well, we but, all uh, did, didn't we? <laughs> but, but the internet revealed what is truly scarce and what isn't, and uh, you don't want what isn't. I mean, if you have a general bookstore and you're offering a lot of books at low prices, it's fine. But if you want to sell things for higher prices, uh, yeah, especially, especially the collectors in university libraries that, yeah, that do frequently check to see yeah. what else is available yeah. and at how much and from whom. Yeah. It works great for that 10% that is truly scarce. You can now get more for those books Absolutely. than before, but it's only 10%. And unless you can check every time you buy the book, oh, well, is this in the good category or the bad, you just don't want to do it. Uh, yeah. um, so that's, that's where I am, uh, you know, with the internet, that um, uh, it killed off a big part of my business. Mm. And uh, I don't see any way that you can, can get that to work for you anymore. Mm. It's, uh, it's a dead area of stock. Yeah. It's too bad. Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, if you were coming into the book trade today, would you? And if you would, how would you go about it? Yeah. Well, for me, that is an interesting question because I was doing something else before that I could have, if I wanted, continued to do forever. And um, I heard Greg Gibson, one of our colleagues, use the expression legacy phase of his career. And he was specifically talking about this blog he does. Yeah. I recommend it highly. It's good. Uh, and he finally realized that there was a very good reason for it because he was creating a history of the the book business, you know, as he was living it, and that will be a legacy. Um, but when I think about my legacy, and, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying this under these circumstances, I wonder whether it might not have been greater if I'd stayed a teacher. Because after 37 years, I'd be in my 37th year of teaching, mm -hmm. I would have reached an awful lot of students, and I'd like to think I would have changed some lives. Have I changed lives with my book selling? Now, when I mention this to people, what they always say is, oh, yeah, but you can do good outside your work. And I absolutely agree. But there are only so many hours in the day. And if right. you can do the good at the same time you're doing your work, that's a huge it's advantage. Huge, yeah. And so I, I do think about that. Uh, you know, maybe from a financial point of view, it was an okay decision, no problem. Yeah. Although once you go into retirement, you don't have that pension that you would as a retired <laughs> university you get Social Security. And you paid for your health insurance all those years on your own as opposed to the yeah. university covering it. Yeah, that's a financial hit. But overall, financial.
eventually it's been okay. But this legacy issue I, I do think about. Would I do it? Let, let's just say I didn't have any alternatives to think about. Um, I certainly wouldn't do it the way I actually did do it because investing all the time and energy into those secondary sources would be a disaster strategy mm -hmm. now. Um, and you know, so it's sort of hard to start up with the big books. You know, you got to start little and build up. Well, there was a little for me to start with then with these secondary sources. That little isn't really there anymore yeah, for true. someone. So I don't know how I'd go about it. However, my son is a bookseller too, pretty uh -oh. much on his own, and uh, you know, he's doing I think pretty well. So he's sort of proof that you can do it. Uh, what's he What's he working with? Well, he started out, of course, copying me, yeah. but he has branched out, and uh, he was set up at the other fair for now the fourth year in a row, and. Uh, in some other areas that I don't do, uh, economics, philosophy, um, mostly 20th century yeah. stuff, not the old stuff. I mean, he doesn't have Malthus and yeah. Adam Smith, but for the 20th century people in economics, he's, he's doing very, very well with that. So it can be done, but uh, it's not as easy, I don't think, as no. it used to be. No. And um, so um, that's, that's my somewhat ambivalent, ambiguous yeah. answer to your question. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, if, if back in 1985, although it was really a couple of years before that, that I made my decision to do this career change, if I had seen through the crystal ball, you know, where things would be sure. today, would I have said, well, boy, that book selling has been a lot of fun and it's very tempting, but I'm going to stay an academic. Yeah. I, I, I can't, I can't really know what I would have said. Giant Sight's 2020 vision. Yeah, yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, all, we all could, sometimes we all wish we could go back in time and change some of the decisions we made, but those new changes would create new avenues, more decisions. Yeah. And I think we're all better off where we are right now. I've always liked that movie Groundhog Day oh, yeah. because Bill Murray got to correct his mistakes right. by doing yeah. it over, over and, and over. Well, we, we don't have nauseam. that opportunity. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but so I'm, I'm sure I, I, I have made, well, I know I've made mistakes. We all have. Yeah, right. But, you know, you've got, a, you've got a good life, and, you know, yeah. why look back on what might have been? Yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the great challenges that we face as antiquarian booksellers as we move ahead into the next decade or so? Well, I've heard you ask the question, and, and um, I'll tell you in my own field, because that's all. Right. Where are the future booksellers? because I told you how Ray is my age, Jeremy two years older, John Gatch one year older, several others in the, um, we're almost all in our 60s as a matter of fact. Right. I mean, there are a handful that are older, but almost all of the active people in science and medicine today are in our 60s. And the, here's the important point, we were all doing it before we were 40. Right. These are not late in life people. I look at the situation today, I don't see anybody, not a single person, who is a specialist in science and medicine today in this country who's under 40. Mm. There are a handful in uh, other countries. Some of them are at this book fair. Uh, Christian Westergaard, yeah. Sophia Bush, I mean, he told me today, he's uh, yesterday, that he's only 35. Of course, he's almost at the top already. Yeah. But he's in Denmark, and I can think of a few others. In this country, there's nobody. Now, our books aren't going to disappear. We're going to disappear, right. but w where are they going to go? Who is going to take over the selling of scientific and medical books. Now, maybe some people will see that as we leave the scene, here's an empty niche. Here's there's no competition. Let's move in. It's possible. But it could happen. But there's nobody at the moment who's already working their way up. Unless I've, I've overlooked somebody, I, even my son, because sometimes people nominate him. And I said, yes, he does do science and medicine, but he does these other things as well. Mm -hmm. And they're actually more important for him at the moment. So um, that, is, that is something I really think about. Now, we also always ask the question about, well, where are the customers? Well, I have that same concern, yeah. too. But this is going to have an It won't affect ABAA as an organization, no. perhaps. But there's this subsection of ABA. I mean, look, science and medicine is a major specialty. Is it just going to vanish? I can't believe it will. But how and where will the new specialists come from? Now, in one case, you know, Howard Ru 
Ruth Berg is a second generation. Right. How, but Howard's in his 50s, so he's only a little bit younger right. than the group I'm talking about. Where are the people? Because I started part-time selling when I was roughly 30, but full-time at 38. I was 37 going on 38, and all these other people that I've already mentioned, they were already doing it yeah. then. You know, There's no core of, of, of young, up-and-coming mm -hmm. people now in my specialty. See, I can't really talk about the others. Well, you tell me, in Americana, is there a core of up-and-coming people under mm -hmm. 30? Actually, the, under 40, not under the 40. core of younger people are all visually oriented. Uh -huh. They're into prints, they're, they're into broadsides, they're into paper, they're into the kinds of things that are 20th century rather than 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. And if you look around the fair, uh, the people like Warren Bear, um, uh, Ian Brabner, right. uh, some, uh, Brian Cassidy, uh, these, are, these are newish young booksellers who look at things a lot different than we do. Maybe they're the ones to bring it into the future, I don't know. Well, I'm familiar with what they do, and there's a place for it, and it's obviously working for them. Yeah. But, I, I mean, you can't have an ABAA that's all that. Um, no, um, but, but who knows? Yeah. Who knows what's going to be? Uh, photography is an up-and-coming field. Right. Uh, all these, all these uh, things that people used to throw away uh, are now coming back as, as valuable pieces of, of Americana or radical literature or what yeah. have you. Yeah. So, you know, just to... To wind things down, um, we are a generation of booksellers who used to do it a certain way and can't do it that way anymore. Oh. So we all have to either learn new tricks or suffer. I, I don't know any yeah. answers. Well, I'm 64, and I know most of us, when you ask the question, say, we're going to do it forever until we drop dead or are just physically unable. But I, you know, with all these challenges, it's not as much fun for me, at least, no. as it used to be. I can see by, you know, age 60, only six years away, maybe not completely retiring, but just scaling it back significantly um, because it isn't what it, it, it used to do for me. And if financially I don't need to keep going, maybe I won't. Um, well, there's also physical issues, Malcolm. Right, absolutely. As, as we get older, we can no longer do some of the physical things that are important in the trade to right. do. Yeah. You know, I, I left something, something out that I do. I mean, I'm one of the few people, I'm not the only one, who has exhibited at medical meetings to try right. to reach the top. But that's a lot of wear and it's, tear. It's a lot of work. Yeah, you, you know, you drive your car full of books, you schlep them in yourself unless you want to pay the guys on the loading dock yeah, a fortune. Just, yeah. At, at yeah. age, you know, 50 or even 60, you can do it. But at age 70, am I going to want to do it? Well, I don't think so. I'll you tell know. you, I'm 72 and I don't want to do it. <laughs> you don't want to do even. I don't want to do it. I, I, for the first time in my life, I took a half booth at the Boston Book Fair because I physically did not want to have to deal with a full booth right. and the aggravation that goes along with it. Yeah. But it's a great business. I hope it continues forever. Yeah. Uh, whether you and I will be along for the ride, who knows? Well, we, we know that 50 years from now, we won't be along for the ride, but I'm sure it will Speak still exist. Speak for yourself. It will, <laughs> no, it'll still be here in 50 years, yeah. and some of it you know, will probably be very much the same, but other parts we can't even imagine. imagine. They'll, they'll 50 years from now be watching these interviews and laughing at the oh, things that we were saying. You know, that's what they thought was going to happen. <laughs> uh -huh. But I, I want to give a final statement, a real plug for you, because I have watched a fair number of these and as I've asked people around the hall some haven't watched any of them and every single one of them I found interesting in yeah. some way or another uh, maybe what people say about the internet I've heard before but what I haven't heard is their life stories yeah how they got into uh, how they books. started and mine is I'm sure somewhat like some others but it's a little bit different you know well, so you different. watch them all and you really get a a good picture of how the present generation of booksellers came to be. And without what you're doing, people wouldn't know. So. I've always thought it was important to have a visual record of who we were, because mm -hmm. who knows what's going to be. And I'd like to think that 25 years from now, someone's going to look at an interview and say, gee, that's, that's what he looked like. <laughs> that, that's how he sounded, and that's what he thought. Yeah. I thought that, to me, that's the most important uh, thing. My 
person in the booth next to me today is Joe Falcone, and on his laptop, and I was looking at it right before I came in here, he had pictures from the Doheny auction 25 years, years ago, ago, the people in, in the, the audience. Auction. And, you know, there's so-and-so, and some of them you could recognize right away. 25 years later, they look the same. Others have changed drastically. But just to see them all there, and so you, for this period, are producing... Uh, an even better record of, well, of who we are and were. And uh, so uh, I, I think it's important. Uh, and, thanks for doing it. And on that note, <laughs> we'll call it a day. Okay. Thanks, Malcolm. Thanks, Mike. Good for you to come by. Okay.